Hey everybody, welcome back to Altium Academy and specifically to our part two of our PDN simulation in SPICE video series. I am Zach Peterson. I am your local technical consultant with Altium. And today we are gonna continue looking at PDN impedances. And actually we're not really gonna look so much at just impedance. We're actually gonna look at the transient response on a PDN that we determined from SPICE in our last video. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of the different PDNs in the impedance spectrum and we're going to see if we can correlate these with different transient responses in the transient analysis results. It's going to be a lot of fun. Please feel free to follow along if you can and definitely go look in the description. We've got an ebook that you can download for free and you can learn about all about this stuff and some other important topics in power integrity. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Back here inside of Altium Designer, I've got the simulation dashboard up, so I'll move that out of the way. Basically, this is what we looked at last time. We just had this big bank of capacitors. We have all their parasitics. Um, you know, we've got 36 capacitors here, and there may be some question as to whether that's a large amount or a small amount. I've actually shown some layouts in the past on this particular uh, video series, or not this series, but you know, on other videos, where we've looked at uh, you know silk screen and component arrangement and things like that. If you actually look at some of those VGA layouts for you know 600 pin processors, you'll actually see that the number of capacitors on the PDN can get way bigger than 36. So in some cases, for a large IC with high speed IOs uh, that's running with a lot of current, um, we're actually a little low on our number of capacitors here. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, you may need a lot of capacitors and you may need a lot of plain capacitance in your design. Now in the event you get to some of the transient results that we had last time where we have what looks like a really big peak here right at the beginning. Let me go ahead and show it. So right here at the beginning of the, the, uh, the switching action, um, you might be wondering, you know, is this particular peak real? Is it fake? Is there maybe some other portion portion of the transient response that's hidden here. And the reason I bring this up is because you have to remember this is a numerical simulation. And the accuracy and what you can see in the numerical simulation depends on the resolution that you set in the simulation settings. Now I'm going to go back here to the schematic for just a moment. And if you look at the transient settings, we see that we have a step size of only one nanosecond, okay? So basically that means that we're not gonna be able to capture anything faster than basically a two nanosecond period wave, okay? So about 500 megahertz. If you look at the impedance spectrum, uh, you'll see that we actually have a peak here that is uh, well beyond 500 gigahertz or megahertz. It's actually at about 635 megahertz. So you might wonder, is this you know peak that we saw in the transient results actually correlated to this particular peak in the impedance spectrum? And then also, what is this peak? What's this correlate with in the impedance spectrum? So the reason I bring this up is because if you start to see these types of peaks in the impedance spectrum, there might be something you can do such as adding in capacitors that actually have very low impedance right at these frequencies in order to decrease the size of the transient response and specifically address some of those resonant frequencies that exist in uh, the that exist in the design and then remove those from the transient response. Let's go ahead and go back here to the transient simulation and we want to simulate something a lot finer than one nanosecond. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this 0.1 nanoseconds. Now, of course, if I increase the number of points in the uh, analysis by 10, that means I have 10 times the computation time. So I'm going to have to reduce the, so uh, the length of the simulation. So I'm just going to make it one microsecond. And let's go ahead and run this bad boy and see what we get. So you can already see it's actually taking quite a while to complete. But let's go ahead and see what it comes up with. Oh, it's actually done already. Okay, great. So now we can start to capture some of the uh, finer features in the transient response. And if we zoom in here, we can actually see where this high frequency wave begins. And you can see that it is 
an underdamped response, and it's superimposed on top of this lower frequency response. And that's pretty typical when you're dealing with an LTI system like this that has a transient response. Basically what we're seeing is the sum of transient responses whenever the system is excited with, uh, with a delta function, or not a potential, but a delta function input or a delta function forcing function. But essentially when we excite this with a pulse, we have the potential to uh, excite all of the different transient responses. And then what you're actually seeing on, a, on the screen here is actually a superposition of all of those transient responses. So what we can do is we can actually zoom in here and we can kind of pick out what the frequency is and we just kind of need to zoom in, you know, just close enough to be able to pick out the distance between peaks. So if I go from, you know, here, and I'm like just at the edge of my, uh, just at the edge of my resolution, but from here, that's 103 nanoseconds, to here, it's about 105 nanoseconds. So that's just a little longer than two nanoseconds, it looks like, let's see here. 103.4 to 105.1. So that's actually, that's 105.6. That's actually 1.6 nanoseconds. So if I go to one divided by 1.6, I get 625 megahertz. So 625 megahertz. So what was that peak that we saw in the impedance spectrum? It was at 635 megahertz, right around there. So it's pretty clear that this portion of the response is actually associated with that peak right at 635 megahertz in the PDN impedance spectrum. And then you can see it just kind of persists all the way through while of the, uh, uh, while the, uh, the transistor in the, that we're using to model the load is turned on. So now what about this low frequency response? Can we do the same kind of thing? Well, we actually don't capture an entire period here, but what we have right here is about a half wavelength. So, or a half, uh, a half period, I guess you could say, since this is the time domain. So here we're going from, what is that, 159 nanoseconds to 325 nanoseconds. So let's just call it uh, 175 nanoseconds. So 179.5 nanoseconds times two is going to be uh, 350 nanoseconds. So one divided by 350 times 29. That's right at about 2.8 megahertz. So if we go back to the impedance spectrum, let's see if that correlates with anything. And so you can see right here, if I highlight the purple curve, what do we have right here, right about three megahertz? Well, we have a very nice big peak here. So you can already see that just by looking at the, the peaks in the PDN impedance spectrum, let me make this decibel. So just by looking at the peaks in the impedance spectrum and then the actual responses in the transient results, you can actually kind of correlate and pick out what different peaks are associated with which portions of the transient response. And that's what allows you to basically target different portions of the impedance spectrum with different types of decoupling capacitors so that you can hopefully reduce those specific transient responses in the results and get to a much cleaner transient response on this PDN. One thing I want to address is what happens if we were to maybe add in some inductance here along this power line? What's actually going to happen in the SPICE results? So let's just say for a moment I took this and instead of 25 picofer or picohenries, I had 25 nanohenries. So much, much larger inductance. Well, if I go over to the simulation dashboard, run my transient analysis results. Oh man, this is crazy. Look at how big that transient response is. Now we're back to a really unacceptably large transient response. Um, and let me zoom in here. So first things first, we get like almost total dropout right at the initial moment of uh, where this uh, design turns on. And then if I just kind of zoom in here, we can actually see really the size of this, uh, this variation around, uh, around 1.8 volts. So when I added in that inductance on the power lead going into the load, what did I get? I get this huge transient response. Some would say this is unacceptably large. I think anybody designing a PDN and trying to get to low noise would say that this is unacceptably large. So that's exactly what we see. We see uh, initially we had 1.8 volts, which is exactly what we wanted. We had total dropout of the uh, output voltage down to almost zero. Um, this is what, this is 90 or no, 50 millivolts. So, you know, almost total dropout. And then we have an oscillation uh, between 2.1 volts to 
about 1.25 volts, so a really big oscillation. This is because as you add in more inductance here, you could actually add a new pole into the transfer function for the PDN. So this is a linear time invariant system. The entire PDN can be modeled using transfer functions if you like. And in fact, one tool, mathematical tool that we use is called the transfer impedance. It is a type of transfer function. It just transforms an input current to an output voltage or vice versa. Here, uh, if we think about this in terms of transfer functions, we're essentially doing the same thing. We just added in a new pole into the transfer function by adding in more inductance. And if we then go to, say, the simulation dashboard, run our AC sweep, so I look at the same type of curve, you can see at the high frequency end, I've almost doubled the impedance out to 10 gigahertz, right? So I went from 30 previously to about 70, so unacceptably large again. Here, I haven't even touched this low frequency peak. And here, if you remember, we actually had really nice low impedance out to 100 megahertz and beyond. So we had really, we had some pretty decent results. They were a decent starting point, as I think anyone would say. Um, but once we added in that inductance, you can just see that the uh, uh, the slope here on the PDN impedance spectrum just gets way too large. So once we add in this extra inductance on this power line, we actually get way too much impedance out to high frequencies. Now, this would be just fine if this load was switching extremely slowly or if we just had like a resistive load, meaning it just needed DC current. We didn't care about switching action. We didn't care about AC. We just cared about delivering DC power and that was it. Now remember, integrated circuits, when they switch, they're not operating on DC power anymore. They are, they are actually drawing in current pulses, so you need to do an AC analysis. So that's why all this stuff that we've been doing in SPICE is really important. Hopefully this shows you the value of number one, low impedance and high capacitance versus adding inductance into the PDN to try and bring that uh, transient response down. Bringing in inductance can be counterproductive at high frequencies and high frequencies is exactly where you wanna have low impedance when you're dealing with high speed components. Now, where would this higher inductance come from? Well, it could come from I don't know, adding in a ferrite, let's say, on the power lead for this integrated circuit that we're modeling here. So adding in that inductance, bad, we've seen it uh, here in the results, and you'll see the exact same thing in real boards. Now, there is another possible use of ferrites, which we're actually gonna investigate in a future video, kind of as a part three to all of this. That other use of ferrites is meant to be used for isolation between different rails. So does it work, does it not work? Well, this is actually something where I've seen results showing both cases where it does work and where it doesn't work. So there's actually an older design con paper that you can find linked in one of the blogs in the description. That older design con paper shows a case where it actually does work. We're also gonna link to one of Kellen Knack's articles on Altium's website. That particular article shows a case where it doesn't work. So should you do it, should you not do it? This is a perfect example of a case where if you are gonna do it, you should at least do a simulation to quantify whether or not the transient response you see is gonna be acceptable. So I'm gonna do a guide on that in an upcoming article, or in an upcoming video, I should say. And in the ebook download that we're gonna have in the description, you can actually look at some of those same results in that ebook download. So I hope everybody goes and checks it out. All right, everybody, so thanks for sitting through this and watching. Hopefully this breaks down a little bit how to analyze your PDN and where the inductance might sit and where you exactly you don't want the inductance in your PDN. Frankly, you don't want any inductance if you can help it. Unfortunately, you're always gonna have a little bit of inductance and you wanna just try and minimize it as much as possible. And if you like this video, hit that like button. If you wanna leave a comment or question, hit that comment section. Go ahead and subscribe if you wanna see more of this content, and especially if you wanna see part three to this video series. All right, thanks everybody, and uh, definitely don't forget to call your fabricator.